Hello friends, this is Nishan presenting to you an interesting topic that is thrombotic disorders. So without any delay, let's get started. These are my references for this video. The first two are two really good papers and the last one, of course, everybody knows about it. Robin's Pathological Basis of Disease, one of my favorite books. Any talk on thrombosis is incomplete without talking about Virchow's trial. Virchow's trial gives us three factors that predispose anyone to have thrombosis. Number one is hypercoagulable state and our focus in this video is going to be in these disorders, on these disorders. Number two is stasis of blood. The example of it is stasis of blood uh, in left atrial appendage in atrial fibrillation predispo predisposes to the formation of thrombus. Then endothelial injury. So endothelial injury predisposes to thrombus by causing exposure of various prothrombotic material to the blood. So that results into formation of thrombus. So these three are very important to understand, to understand the concept of thrombotic disorders. Before going into the th thrombotic disorders, let's briefly review the coagulation cascade. Coagulation cascade usually begins in one of the two pathways, extrinsic pathway or intrinsic pathway. Extensic pathway has two important proteins that is tissue factor and factor 7a. So what happens is tissue factor and factor 7a form a complex and this in turn activates the common pathway. Intrinsic pathway has various proteins as listed here of which two very important ones. All of them are of course important but two very important ones and those that have a lot of clinical significance are factor 2a and factor 8a. Factor 8a is anti-hemophilia factor and factor 2a is thrombin. Then common pathway has these factors, factor 10a, 5a, again 2a, fibrin and fibrin, factor 13a. This when it occurs in a harmony and it occurs as it should occur, uh, it in turn forms a fibrin clot and factor 13a, it stabilizes this clot. So factor 13 a is also called as the fibrin stabilizing factor. If you have this basic knowledge of the coagulation cascade, I think you will be in good position to just uh, understand the thrombotic disorders. So let's move on. Now this control of this coagulation pathway like the extrinsic, the intrinsic, the common and finally the fibrin clot. The control of this pathway is mainly done by three groups of proteins. Number one is antithrombins. What, how antithrombins act is basically they inhibit the action of thrombin and other serine proteases like factor 9a, 10a, 11a and 12a. Then protein C and S, they cause proteolytic cleavage of factor 5a and factor 8a, that is activated factor 5 and activated factor 8. Then tissue factor pathway inhibitor, what it does is it basically acts on extensive pathway in that it causes inactivation of tissue factor and factor 7a complex and in turn stops the activation of common pathway. Defect in these can lead to various thrombotic disorders. So let's see uh, how do we approach them. There are various ways to classify the thrombotic disorders. How What I have used for this video is basically a classification which divides them into hereditary and acquired forms. In hereditary there are Four important diseases. Number one is factor 5 leaden mutation. Number two is prothrombin gene mutation. Number three is protein C and S deficiencies and number four is antithrombin deficiencies. Then in acquired the list is quite big. So what I did is I just enlisted three very important ones. So malignancy especially most of the many of the adenocarcinomas then immobilization uh, after surgery or any other procedure then antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and there are many more like medication use like oral contraceptives and etc. So when do you suspect hereditary thrombophilias? You suspect them mainly in these three conditions. Number one, young patient with unprovoked thrombosis. Let's say we have a 25 year old male who has upper extremity DVT and who has no established risk factors whatsoever for a DVT. So you suspect them in these patients. Then patient with recurrent thrombosis, let's see somebody comes and 
he says that he has this is the fourth episode of dvt he has in the last couple of years that is when you should suspect hereditary thrombophilias then patient with family history of thrombotic disorder this is just a giveaway like the, if there is a family history you usually suspect a genetic disorder so hereditary thrombophilias you should suspect them let's talk about a few hereditary thrombotic disorders number one is factor 5 latent mutation Factor V latent mutation is the most common hereditary thrombotic disorder. It is autosomal dominant gain of function mutation. What happens in this is basically the structure of factor V is altered or modified. There is substitution of one amino acid with another and that results into an altered structure of factor V that is resistant to breakdown by activated protein C. Can you guys remind me what all proteins does or what all clotting factors does activated protein C inactivate or break down proteolytically? Yes, that's correct. 5A and 8A. So when the breakdown of factor 5A doesn't happen, it continues on doing its function and that results into increased coagulation, in turn thrombosis. Now prothrombin gene mutation is again one more autosomal dominant gain of function mutation. What is happening here is there is increased production of prothrombin or factor 2. Mind you, fact, prothrombin is factor 2 and 2A is thrombin. So what happens is there is more conversion of 2 to 2A that results into more activation of coagulation cascade that is increased activation of coagulation cascade and in turn leads to various thrombotic events. Antithrombin deficiency. So can you guys remind me of function of antithrombin? Yes, that's correct. Antithrombin inactivates thrombin and various serine proteases like 9A, factor 9A, 10A, 11A and 12A. So when, when there is loss of function of antithrombin, there occurs thrombosis. So what will happen is these factors will not be inactivated and that will result into O overly active coagulation cascade that in turn will result into thrombosis. There are two types of antithrombin deficiency type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is a quantitative defect that is there is a decreased quantity of antithrombin. Type 2 is qualitative defect where the antithrombin is produced in normal or increased amount but is non-functional. Then it is important to remember that although antithrombin deficiencies are rare as compared to factor 5 leaden and prothrombin gene mutations, they are associated with more severe disease. That is, there will be more incidence of recurrent thrombosis in antithrombin deficiencies as compared to factor 5 leaden and prothrombin gene mutations. Then, one more thing that I would like to mention is antithrombin, their activity increases by 4000 fold in presence of heparin. So can you guys tell me a condition where heparin will essentially be non-functional? Giving heparin will not be of any use to the patient in, in view of anticoagulation. Yes, you are looking at it. It's antithrombin deficiency because antithrombin def, uh, the mainstay of mechanism of action of heparin is that it binds to antithrombin and it causes its activation. And this results into the function, its function that is anticoagulation. But in presence, in absence of antithrombin, that won't happen. So it will render, it will render the heparin not very useful for the purpose of anticoagulation. So protein C and S deficiencies. So basically, again, these are autosomal dominant loss of function mutation. What happens is that protein C it forms activated protein C in presence of protein S as a cofactor. So this activated protein C, what it does is it inactivates factor 5A and factor 8A. When the level of activated protein C goes down, that will result from decreased levels of protein C itself. The levels of factor 5A and 8A will go up. This results into increased coagulation. And this, in turn, will result into increased risk of thrombosis. This again is rare, but severe disease. 
One note that I would like to make is that protein C deficient patients when given warfarin they develop skin necrosis. Worried about acquired thrombophilias. So when should you suspect them? We saw that we suspect the hereditary thrombophilias in patients who are young age, then who have recurrent thrombosis or who perhaps have a family history of thrombotic disease. So you suspect acquired thrombophilias in elderly patients that is age more than 50 years. Then again, patients with risk factors for malignancies. Say somebody is a smoker or somebody has some risk factor for gastric or pancreatic cancer. In that case, you will suspect thom acquired thrombophilias. Again, a specific age group patient that I would like to mention is a young or middle-aged female that has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. If somebody has, re uh, if a young female or 25 year old female comes to you with recurrent abortions or any thromboembolic disease, one of the first thing that should be on your list is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So how do you investigate a case of thrombophilia? They are grouped into, the tests are grouped into two categories, number one high yield and number two lower yield. High yield tests or high yield investigations are those that are more definitive tests on perhaps more common disorders. Testing for factor V laden mutation or testing for prothrombin gene mutation can help in diagnosing these disorders. Then testing for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome by testing for say anti-cardiolipin antibodies, anti-beta-2 microglobulin antibodies can help in diagnosing these disorders. Lower yield investigations that are done as secondary evaluation or if these evaluations come out to be negative are protein C and protein S levels and antithrombin levels. It is very important to remember that these tests should be done at least two weeks after the thrombotic episode because if there is a thrombus, it is quite obvious that protein C, protein S and pro antithrombin will be doing their best to anticoagulate or it's basic, it basically it's their function to anticoagulate. So in presence of a thrombus, their levels are bound to be decreased. So, when should you test for protein C, S and antithrombin is at least two weeks after a thrombotic episode. For acquired disorders, I would like to tell three important tests that can be done. Number one is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Test for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. There is a big list of various antibodies like anti-cardiolipin, then anti-beta-2 microglobulin, etc. You can just Google the apply antibodies and just have a look at them. Then presence for presence of JAK mutation. Chronic myeloproliferative disorders are associated with increased risk of thrombosis. So testing for JAK2 mutation might yield us a diagnosis. And screening for malignancy in various forms like doing a colonoscopy for CA colon, then doing a LDCT for or low dose CT for lung doing a abdominal CT for pancreatic cancer or any other screening for malignancies in other form can also help us make a diagnosis in specific group of patients. So that's about the thrombotic disorders. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Vivek R. Sharma MD, one of the most knowledgeable benign hematologists that I have seen for teaching me this topic. Very special thank to you guys for watching the video. If you like the video, please like, share and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions, concerns or doubts, please feel free to reach me at love.intimate at the rate of gmail.com. Again, thanks a lot.